balanced regulation plays a role in this and in, in, in enabling capital to, to be allocated freely and people to move from job to job. All those things go into it, but these are, these are long-run important issues. Uh, particularly, and another one is the potential growth rate of the country, which is, um, looks like it's slowed down because of aging, really, and demographics and things like that. So these are big issues. We can't really affect them with monetary policy. Thank you. <clears throat> Senator Cortez Mastel. Thank you. Chairman Powell, thank you for being here, and, th and thank you for uh, also answering our questions. Uh, I, I appreciate your comments earlier in the introduction um, and um, m noting which you admitted that the aggregate numbers do look good. But I also noted in your presentation that uh, there's a quote that you um, say, and, and, and it's this, and while three-fourths of whites responded in a recent Federal <coughs> Reserve survey that they were doing at least okay financially in 2017, at least, at least okay, only two-thirds of African Americans and Hispanics responded that way um, when it comes to um, uh, financially whether they were doing okay. And I think that's what this comes down to. It comes down to those individuals who are living out there who are struggling, <coughs> how much money is in their pocket, how much it can pay for. I noticed you talked about the wages are up 0.27 percent, price index increased to 2.3 percent. Um, so in response to Senator Mendez's question about the steps that you were taking for broad-based wage growth, um, you answered several things. But let me ask you this. Is it your opinion that it is the Fed's responsibility or role to do something about wage growth, broad-based wage growth, to play a role there? Um, I think, uh, you know, the, the, what you've assigned us is literally maximum employment and stable prices, so, um, and also financial stability. We have a, an overall responsibility for that. Um, maximum employment, the sense of that is it's not just one measure. It's a, it's a broad range of measures, and I think we've really you know, we've worked hard and, and to, to provide support for the labor markets. And that would include wage growth, then? It would. Uh, wage growth comes into really both of those things. It comes into maximum employment. It also comes into inflation. Good. I'm glad you said that, because <clears throat> here's the other thing that you said that concerned me. Um, and you said one way to address and increase uh, wage growth was um, incomes need to go up, um, uh, and they only go up with higher productivity. Uh, and that's what you said needs to occur. But... Let me ask you this, because I have looked at some of the economists and um, studied some of the reports in the last 30 years or so, and I know that was true probably from 1950 to 1970s, that they were both going up together. But we also have studies that show from 1973 to 2016, it was just the opposite. They're divergent, that productivity went up by 73.7 percent. But the hourly pay went up 12.5 percent, only 12.5 percent. That's 5.9 times more, more productivity than pay. So knowing that, how can you say that we need to focus on higher productivity because that will also increase wages? So what, what I said was that over a long period of time, wages can't go or grow up go up sustainably without productivity also increasing. I'm not, it, it, it's a different thing to say that higher productivity guarantees higher wages. I didn't say that, and I don't think that's true. I know very well the charts you're so talking what, about. So then what tools, then what are you doing to address wage growth we, to ensure that we are increasing wages? Because, because here's, here's what's happening, uh, and, and you know this. If you're in your community, and I'm hoping you are, and you're talking to people across America, you know that wages have been flat since 1973. That means that the people that I go home, and in my family and uh, Nevadans in general who are struggling, uh, they don't have em enough money to pay for housing costs, for health care, for education, uh, for prescription drugs. A and what, what do I tell them that you're doing to look out for their interests to help them and improve their lives with the tools that you have? So the, the tool that we have is monetary policy, and we can, we can and we now have. Put it, no, I appreciate that. Now, let me ask you this. Can you just put it in terms, if you're talking to a constituent in my state, to explain to them what you're doing. Now, remember, Nevada was a place where we had the foreclosure crisis. People lost their homes. They lost their jobs. We had 15 percent unemployment at one point in time, uh, underwater in, uh, in their homes. What would you say to those individuals that you're doing to ensure, one, it doesn't happen again, and two, improve the wage growth for them? We're doing everything we can with our tools to make sure that if you want a job, you can have one. 
And but having a job and having a wage, uh, livable wage, are two different things. Yeah, o over the long term, we don't have those tools. You have those tools. Congress, is, Congress has the tools to assure stronger wage growth over time. We, we really don't have that. With, oh, we, we can move interest rates around to support activity, support hiring. We, we don't have the tools to support higher productivity, for example, which tends to lead to higher wages without guaranteeing them. But as an economist, them. you can work with us and tell us the tools or the uh, things yes. that, would, that can be done, like uh, increasing the minimum wage that might improve livable wages for individuals, correct? So I, I would say principally over long periods of time, investing in education and in skills are the single, that's the single best thing we can do to have a productive workforce and, and, and share pros prosperity widely, which is what we all want. Uh, and I know my time is up, and I, I appreciate that. But, uh, but I'm concerned. Is that based on your own individual uh, opinion, or is that research or data or information that you know that shows that? It's a lot of research. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Senator Donnelly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Powell, I'm worried about farmers in my state. Okay, I checked about an hour ago. Um, soybean prices are $8.40 a bushel, well below the cost of production right now. Corn uh, is $3.48 a bushel, well below the cost of production. In the last couple of weeks, I've visited with a number of Hoosier farmers and groups like the Indiana Corn and Soybean Alliance and the Indiana Farm Bureau to hear their growing concerns with falling commodity prices and uncertain trade price policies, which are already harming Hoosier farmers and rural communities. <clears throat> Let me tell you a conversation I had last Friday. It was with a businessman who's also a farmer. And he's telling me about he just bought 140 acres from another farmer. And he said, Joe, I told the farmer, I, I, I don't want to buy this from you right now because I know you're struggling. And I know you don't want to sell this. Um, and I don't want to take advantage of you. And the farmer who's selling it said, if I don't sell this, I could start losing everything else. And so you're actually helping me out. This is, this is um, where our rural economy is going right now. Um, I've also heard from local businesses dealing with canceled orders because of the tariffs. Price of soybeans, as I mentioned, it's a 10-year low, 10-year low, due largely to the Chinese tariffs on U.S. exports. Um, this current policy, what I worry about is that it's already damaged foreign export markets that took decades and decades to build. And so... Um, what I'm asking you is what would be the long-term impact of falling commodity prices and reduced agriculture exports on rural communities, um, which are struggling in so many ways already? Well, I, I think we know it would be very bad, and we've seen periods uh, in American history where that's happened and can be extremely tough on farmers and rural communities. And um, <clears throat> if they lose the markets that they've developed... Um, I was over in, in China talking to some of their defense leaders a few years ago about North Korea and was walking through the airport. And there was a group, just by coincidence, it was a flight back home, uh, the flight to Chicago and then go back home to Indiana, a group of Indiana soybean farmers who were traveling the country, developing the market. <clears throat> and um, what happens to rural communities if, uh, if China just looks up and says, you know, we found more reliable suppliers? It, it, as we discussed, it can be, can be very tough. So as Fed Chairman, what would you say um, to all those farmers who are really nervous, really concerned um, about what their future uh, will be? They, they look to uh, us for smart policies, for reasonable policies. Um, is there anything you can say about this trade war that's going on right now? Um, I, I should, again, start by saying that it's, <clears throat> it's really not the Fed's role. We don't do trade policy. It's, that's uh, Congress and the administration. Um, but, um, you know, I, I think if the current process of negotiation back and forth results in lower tariffs, that will be a good thing for the economy. If it results in higher tariffs, then I think, you know, I hardly need to tell you what higher tariffs would do for agricultural producers. Well, Agriculture is an area where we, where we lead the world in productivity and we're great exporters. 
and um, you know you'd be very hard hit by these tariffs. If this goes on for a couple more years, what would be the impact on uh, on our rural communities? I think certainly it would be very tough on the rural communities, and and um, you know I think we'd feel that at the national level too. Let me also ask you about um, <clears throat> opioids, which you've mentioned in workforce participation. My state's been deeply impacted by the <clears throat> opioid crisis. Um, last summer, during one of her final appearances before Congress, I spoke with um, former Chair Janet Yellen about the opioid epidemic and its connection to not just health outcomes, but also economic and employment outcomes. Um, the impact of opioids on the labor participation rate, which has declined from 66 to 63 percent over the last decade. She agreed there was a connection and noted surveys suggest that many prime age individuals who are not actively participating in the labor market are involved in prescription drug use. Um, you know, I, I look at these people we've lost, the, the next <clears throat> teachers, the next doctors, the next electricians, um, the next nurses. Um, what do you see as the impact of the opioid epidemic on our workforce participation and in general, the economy? You know, it's a terrible human tragedy for many communities, certainly for the individuals and their families involved. I think from an economic standpoint, some high percentage of the prime age people who are not in the labor force, um, particularly prime age males who are not in the labor force, are uh, are taking painkillers of some of some kind. I think the number that uh, Alan Kruger, who's a professor, uh, came up with was 44 percent of them. So it's a big number. It's it's having a a terrible human toll on our on our communities, and also it, it matters a lot for labor force, for force participation and economic activity in our country. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. <clears throat> Chairman. Thank you, Senator Donnelly. And that concludes the questioning, but Senator 30, Brown 30 wants 30 to seconds, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I, a number of our um, of colleagues have talked about the um, uh, about uh, productivity and non, uh, non-supervisory pay uh, that uh, pay has gone up 27 percent, and that I mean two point. I'm sorry, 2.7 percent. But it's important to re from from June to June. I think was what one one my colleague said. But it's important to recognize that CPI has gone up three percent so that period. So we should really never talk about nominal pay. We should talk about real dollar pay. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right. Thank you, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, again for being here. We appreciate your uh, your uh, your work, and also your taking the time to come here and respond to our questions. For senators wishing to submit questions for the record, those questions are due in one week on Tuesday, July 24th. And Chairman Powell, we ask that you respond as promptly as you can to the questions that may come in. Again, we thank you for being here. This is very good timing. We've got a vote underway right now. So uh, we appreciate uh, you helping to steer this, this uh, hearing to a, a good conclusion. With that, the hearing is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>